fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I'd like to welcome you to our study or lesson prep for Helaman chapter 7 through 12 this week. And thank you so much for joining me. The purpose of this channel is not only to give you insight into the scriptures, there are lots of sources for that, but also provide you with methods and materials to teach that insight to other people in relevant and meaningful ways, whether that's in the classroom or with your own family. And if you're interested in lesson plans, the PowerPoint slides that I use, or the handouts that I make, please go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. And with that said, I invite you to grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And I'm afraid that I have to say that this week's block of scripture is a little more discouraging than most, which makes it a bit difficult to teach. There is a, a rather pessimistic view of human nature offered in these chapters, and, and I personally consider myself more of an optimist. But it is realistic, and there are important truths to be gleaned from it. The problems and the attitudes that are portrayed in these chapters are real, and they're evident in our modern world. These chapters show a society at its almost absolute worst, and they stand as a warning to all nations and individuals, saying, don't let this happen to you. And so for an icebreaker, let's begin with this question. Can you give me some examples of bad news from the past year in world history? And uh, they should be able to come up with uh, quite a few examples of bad news. There's a lot of it in our world, and you know, there always has been. Right now, at the making of this video, it's the year 2020, and I could give you numerous examples of difficult and bad things occurring in our world right now. Well, in this lesson, we're going to start with the bad so that we can hopefully end on a more positive note. And what we find in Helaman chapter 7 through 12 is one of the most discouraging and dark times in Nephite history. It would be difficult not to have a pessimistic view of human nature while living at this time. If you remember last week, we talked about the three-headed snake that slithers its way into Nephite society. Well, here's the fallout of those problems. And in Helaman chapter 12, you're going to get Mormon's commentary on this time period. And I'm afraid it's not very flattering. And we have to keep in mind that Mormon himself is living in a very dark and discouraging time. So our first item of business is going to be to identify the bad news, and decide whether we have the same kinds of things happening in our day. And I'm going to do this kind of quickly because I'd really like to focus our time and attention elsewhere. But it's important to get a grasp of the setting Nephi and Mormon are describing here. So let's begin with Helaman 7, 4 through 5. And what Nephi observes is great corruption in the government and their laws. The Gadianton robbers have really taken hold of the leadership among the Nephites, and justice is just not being served. He says, And seeing the people in a state of such awful wickedness, and those Gadianton robbers filling the judgment seats, having usurped the power and authority over the land, laying aside the commandments of God, and not in the least a right before him, doing no justice unto the children of men condemning the righteous because of their righteousness, letting the guilty and the wicked go unpunished because of their money, and moreover to be held in office at the head of government, to rule and do according to their wills, that they might get gain and glory of the world, and moreover that they might the more easily commit adultery and steal and kill and do according to their own wills. Well, Helaman 5.2 tells us that for as their laws and their governments were established by the voice of the people, and they who chose evil were more numerous than they who chose good, therefore they were ripening for destruction, for the laws had become corrupted. And that reminds me of a specific truth that was taught way back in Mosiah chapter 29, verses 26 through 27. Now it's not common that the voice of the people desireth anything contrary to that which is right. But it is common for the lesser part of the people to desire that which is not right. Therefore, this shall ye observe and make it your law, to do your business by the voice of the people. And if the time comes that the voice of the people doth choose iniquity, 
Then is the time that the judgments of God will come upon you. Yea, then is the time he will visit you with great destruction, even as he has hitherto visited this land. Well, unfortunately, uh, the Nephites have entered just such a time where the majority are choosing evil and the good and the righteous are in the minority. Therefore, what can you expect to find in the coming chapters? Yep, <laughs> the judgments of God and great destruction. And that widespread wickedness causes Nephi to get up on his garden tower and lament the wickedness of his brethren. He says, Oh, that I could have had my days in the days when my father Nephi first came out of the land of Jerusalem, that I could have joyed with him in the promised land. Then were his people easy to be entreated, firm to keep the commandments of God, and slow to be led to do iniquity. And they were quick to hearken unto the words of the Lord. Yea, if my days could have been in those days, then would my soul have had joy in the righteousness of my brethren. But behold, I am consigned that these are my days, and that my soul shall be filled with sorrow, because of this the wickedness of my brethren. Well, maybe you felt that way before. Oh, I wish I could have been born in another time. Perhaps during the days of Joseph Smith, or, or David O. McKay, or some other previous generation, where things seem to be better or easier. Of course, there may be some naivety in, in the request, since all ages have their difficulties and temptations that we just may not understand. We do tend to idealize the past. But it's not an uncommon wish that, that we could live in some other circumstances or time. Well, as the crowds begin to gather around Nephi's tower, he says in 7 verses 15 through 16 that the devil had a great hold on their hearts and that he would eventually hurl away their souls to everlasting misery and endless woe. And I find the phrase hurl away intriguing. That's what Satan does with those who listen to him. There's no loyalty or assistance given to those who prop him up. It suggests an uncaring or dismissive attitude towards those who follow him. It reminds me of Alma chapter 30 verse 60 where we're reminded that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. Why would we choose him then? Nephi continues his rebuke in chapter 8 and says in verse 24, And now, seeing ye know these things and cannot deny them, except ye shall lie, therefore in this ye have sinned. For ye have rejected all these things, notwithstanding so many evidences which ye have received. Yea, even ye have received all things, both things in heaven and all things which are in the earth, as a witness that they are true. The bad news here is that they've rejected all the evidences of the truthfulness of the gospel. They've closed their hearts and their minds to all the testimonies of God's power that surrounds them. What were those witnesses? It reminds me of Alma before Korahor, where he says, Thou hast had signs enough. Will ye tempt your God? Will ye say, Show unto me a sign, when ye have the testimony of all these thy brethren, and also all the holy prophets? The scriptures are laid before thee. Yea, and all things denote there is a God. Yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it. Yea, and its motion. Yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. These Nephites have also had plenty of signs and witnesses from God. And you know what? They're just about to reject another. Helaman 9 relates the story of Nephi predicting the murder of the chief judge. And he does this as a demonstration of the corruption of their society. And in miraculous fashion, he first prophesies the murder, which turns out to be true, then prophesies who the murderer is, how he will be caught, and how he'll confess to his crime, which all comes true exactly as Nephi predicts it. Now, I may not take the time in class to go through that entire story, but I would at least summarize it. It's an incredible miracle and a great demonstration of God's power. But how do the majority of the people react to this miracle? Helaman 10.1 and it came to pass that there arose a division among the people, insomuch that they divided hither and thither and went their ways. 
leaving Nephi alone as he was standing in the midst of them. And then 10.13. Now behold, notwithstanding that great miracle which Nephi had done in telling them concerning the death of the chief judge, they did harden their hearts and did not hearken unto the words of the Lord. What's the bad news here? Apathy. They are apathetic even towards clear indications of God's power. They just leave. They go home, leaving Nephi alone in the midst of them. No change, no desire to repent. Just a, huh, that was interesting. Oh well, back to life as normal. It's a perfect example of the principle that miracles and signs do a very poor job of creating faith. They're wonderful for faith that already exists, but very ineffective at producing it. I feel there's, there's a lot of evidence of this attitude in today's world. God's miracles and displays of his power are, are all around us, and yet most just seem to shrug it off as coincidence and go about their day. Or on a more personal level, maybe, do we as members of the church listen to the prophets at general conference and say things like, well, that was a really good talk, but then walk away with no plans or intentions to change or apply their lessons in our lives? Do we return to our homes, leaving them standing alone in the midst? Now, Helaman 11 is a little more hopeful, as Nephi calls a mighty famine in the land, which causes the people to eventually humble themselves and repent. And they do enjoy a time of righteousness and peace. However, the bad news comes pretty quickly in chapter 11, verses 36 to 37. And you can see that it doesn't take long before they've fallen right back into pride and wickedness. Their repentance is short-lived. And not long after the famine has ended, they've returned to their wicked ways. Which reminds me of one of the most uh, disgusting scriptures of all time, Proverbs 26:11. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Gross, but true. When we return to our sins after we've gone through the repentance process, it's just as gross. And that leads us to chapter 12. Helam and 12 is full of bad news. Like I said earlier, it's Mormon's commentary on the whole situation. And here he comes to some very disheartening conclusions. Helam in 12 verses 1 through 2. The bad news here is that it seems that at the very moment God blesses and prospers a righteous people, they begin to forget him and trample his commandments under their feet. It's such a sad truth. I mean, what's a God to do? Of course he wants his children to be happy. He wants to reward them for their goodness. In fact, the principles of righteousness naturally lead to good and rewarding outcomes. But he realizes there is a great risk involved with that blessing, with that prosperity. When people have their hands full of worldly wealth, they don't seem to leave any room for God. Or they begin to become satisfied with the type of happiness that materialism and wealth can provide them. So we move to the next bit of bad news. Helam in chapter 12, verse 3. Sometimes the only way God can turn around a wicked people is with chastening and challenge and consequence. I'm sure God doesn't enjoy seeing his children suffer in these ways. It's not his desire. But how else can he help them to remember his gospel and the source of true happiness? So... Verses 4 through 6. Here is Mormon's very unflattering view of human nature. His conclusions about mankind. They're foolish, vain, evil, devilish, quick to do iniquity, slow to do good. Quick to hearken to the evil one. They set their hearts upon the vain things of the world. Quick to pride, quick to boast, quick to iniquity. Slow to remember God and his counsels and his wisdom. They're rebellious, and they want to do their own thing rather than listen to their good and merciful Father. Ouch! 
any evidence that that's true? Yeah, I think he kind of hits the nail on the head there. I can think of many examples of individuals that fit some of these descriptions in our world today. Even more discouraging, I see myself in there. There, there are times when I fall into these categories. Times when I've been foolish and prideful. When I've set my heart on the vain things of the world. Times when I was slow to remember God. Rebellious and, and wanted to just do what I wanted to do instead of trusting in the wisdom and counsels of a merciful Father in heaven. So as you look at that list of bad news, I ask my class, have you seen any evidence of these problems nowadays? And, I, you know, I've already given you a few examples, but I'm sure that you could all come up with quite a few examples of your own. Well, there is one other piece of bad news that I've decided to save for last, and it's what I feel is the biggest problem the Nephites have throughout all of this. It's the issue that has basically led to all the other problems. And I'm pretty sure that most of you know how the Book of Mormon ends as far as the Nephites are concerned. They're destroyed. Completely. My question, what destroyed the Nephites? If you said Lamanites, I'm afraid you're only partly correct. Both Mormon and the Lord came up with a different answer. Take a look in either Moroni 8.27 or Doctrine and Covenants 38.39 to tell me what really brought them down. And the answer is pride. Pride destroyed the Nephites. Mormon says that it was the pride of their nation that had proven their destruction. And the Lord warns us in the Doctrine and Covenants to beware of pride, lest we become as the Nephites of old. Pride is one of the biggest and most dangerous sins we can grapple with because it's so easy to fall into, and it acts as a type of gateway sin to many, many other forms of spiritual sickness. Remember last week how we identified the problem of pride and how it works? We saw the evolution of it amongst the Nephites as it went from being little pride to then just pride to exceedingly great pride over a period of not many years and that it did grow upon them from day to day. Pride is the type of problem that poisons slowly by degrees. In chapter 7 through 12, look how many times it's brought up. Maybe you could mark these in one color as, as I highlight these for you. Helaman 7.5, the reason there's so much corruption in the government is because they wish to get gain and the glory of the world. That's pride. Chapter 7, 20 through 21, They've forgotten God because they want gain and to be praised of men. Chapter 7, 26. Yea, woe shall come unto you because of that pride which ye have suffered to enter your hearts, which has lifted you up beyond that which is good because of your exceedingly great riches. 8, 25. He says that they aren't laying up for themselves treasures in heaven. Why do you think that is? Because they're laying up for themselves treasures on earth and then heaping up judgments in heaven. Then in chapters 9 through 10, what do you think it was that caused them to reject the miracle of Nephi's prediction of the chief judge's murder? Pride. After their short-lived repentance during the famine of chapter 11, what creeps back in? Chapter 11, 37. They did wax stronger and stronger in their pride and in their wickedness. And in chapter 12, verse 5, Mormon observes how quick they are to be lifted up in pride. Well, pride is the spark plug that starts the engine of wickedness running. And we are constantly surrounded by invitations to pride. And here's one of the reasons why. God made every single one of us very different. He apparently likes variety and diversity. We come from different backgrounds, have different gifts, look differently, experience varying levels of prosperity, and have been blessed in different ways. What God hopes, I think, is that we'll celebrate those differences, admire them, and be grateful for what we've been given, and then rejoice in the strengths and the gifts of others. 
He also provides us with opportunities to bless others who have been given less. And power and love is created through that giving and receiving. Unfortunately, the downside to all that diversity is that when we see a difference between ourselves and others, the adversary is always there to tempt us to decide whose way of being different is better. Or we come to the erroneous conclusion that because we have more of something, that therefore we are better. Whether that's money or intelligence or talent or good looks, we almost can't help but feel superior. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote some brilliant things about pride, and he's been quoted by a number of apostles in General Conference. But he said, The point is that each person's pride is in competition with everyone else's pride. It's because I wanted to be the big noise at the party that I am so annoyed at someone else being the big noise. Now, what you want to get clear is that pride is essentially competitive is competitive by its very nature, while the other vices are competitive only, so to speak, by accident. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. It's a pretty good description of how pride works, isn't it? Well, I believe that Mormon offers us a solution to the problem of pride here in chapter 12. There is a realization that we must come to. And I usually like to introduce this with a bit of an activity. We're going to take a little test, and I call this the dumber than dirt test, right? I'm going to ask you a few general trivia questions from different categories to test your intelligence. Then we're going to correct it, and I'll give you a ranking based on how well you did. So here you go. Question number one, art here. Who painted Starry Night? Number two. Sports. Which country has won the most World Cups in soccer? Number three, U.S. history. Name a U.S. president that was assassinated besides Lincoln or Kennedy. Number four, world history. Put these civilizations in order from earliest to latest. Greeks, Romans, Egyptians. Number five, science. What is the sixth planet in our solar system? And then number six, religion. Are you completely obedient to all of God's commandments? That's our, uh, that's our test there. And uh, if you're ready, we can go ahead and take a look at the answers. Who painted Starry Night? Vincent van Gogh. Which country has won the most World Cups in soccer? Well, that would be uh, one of my favorite countries where I serve my mission. None other than Brazil. Brazil has won uh, five World Cups. Number three, a U.S. president that was assassinated besides Lincoln or Kennedy. There are two options there. James Garfield or William McKinley. Number four, civilizations from earliest to latest. It should go Egyptians then the Greeks, then the Romans. And then uh, the sixth planet in our solar system, that would be Saturn. And then the answer to number six, well, only you know how to answer that one, don't you? Well, here are the rankings based on what you did. Give yourself a score out of six. And uh, if you only got one question right, well then, your ranking, you're dumber than dirt, all right? If you got two right, well, guess what? You're still dumber than dirt. If you got three right, though, you're dumber than dirt. If you got four, 
still dumber than dirt. Five, you guessed it. Even if you got all those first five correct, you are dumber than dirt. Now, even if you got all of the first five questions right, but had to answer number six with a no, then you got it, you're dumber than dirt. Now, you might be beginning to wonder if there are any other possible rankings here. And, and, and yes, there is. And that is if you answered number six correctly, all right? Even if you missed all the other five, but if you answered number six with a yes, then you know what? You are a genius, all right? That is the only other possible ranking you can get on this test. Now, why is that? Why would we be considered dumber than dirt if we don't obey God's commandments? Read Helam in chapter 12, verses 7 through 19 to find out. And what he says is, Oh, how great is the nothingness of the children of men. Yea, even they are less than the dust of the earth, than the dirt. For behold, the dust of the earth moveth hither and thither to the dividing asunder at the command of our great and everlasting God. Yea, behold, at his voice do the hills and the mountains tremble and quake. And by the power of his voice they are broken up and become smooth, yea, even like unto a valley. Yea, by the power of his voice doth the whole earth shake. Yea, by the power of his voice do the foundations rock, even to the very center. Yea, and if he say unto the earth, Move, it is moved. Now, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but do you get the message? He's saying that at least the dust of the earth obeys God. Anything the Lord commands the earth to do, it does. It obeys, and with exactness. Now, now that is a rhetorical device, of course, that, that Mormon uses to make a point. And uh, we should be careful not to make a doctrinal conclusion about the earth itself having agency or, or a consciousness. Mormon wants us to be humble. And what better way to make us feel humble than to remind us of our nothingness compared to the greatness of God? Since we're so apt to make comparisons with other people, he's going to give us a comparison of his own. Compared to the dust of the earth, we're less. The dust of the earth is more intelligent because it listens to God. And that thought should help us to be humble. One of the best solutions to pride is to meet God, to get to know him and to recognize his wisdom and his power. Pride is not always directed at just our fellow man, but at God too. We may be tempted to think that we don't need God's counsels, his commandments, or his blessings. We begin to forget that we're completely dependent on him at every moment, and everything we have and are, are because of him. C.S. Lewis once again, In God you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So, we've got to come to know God. Get to know Him through prayer, through the scriptures, through the prophets, through spiritual experiences. And humility is sure to grow in your heart. Now, that there is a bit of a balance to strike here. Of course, as God's children, we aren't nothing. Um, each of us has the capacity to become like God. And Doctrine and Covenants 18.10 tells us that the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. But at the same time, if I go around thinking that I'm all that, or get filled with a sense of my own self-importance, then I begin to forget God. It reminds me of Moses chapter 1, where Moses, after seeing the enormity of God's creation and his power, comes to the conclusion that man is nothing. But by the end of that chapter, we get God's famous statement that his work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. In other words, to God, man is everything. 
Mankind is his work and his glory. So which is it? Am I nothing or everything? It's a bit of a paradox, but I would say that both statements are true. Sometimes we need more of the, oh, how great is the nothingness of the children of men message. And at other times, we may need more of the, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God message. And I'll leave it to you and the Spirit to determine which message you most need to hear. We probably all need a little bit of both at various times in our lives. So some questions you might ask. Do you recognize any part of yourself in the Nephites of this time period? In what areas do you struggle with feelings of pride? What has helped you to be humble and to come to know God better? And do you need more of the nothingness of man message or the worth of souls is great message in your life right now? Well, I'd like to end this more discouraging part of the lesson with the Lord's warning from the Doctrine and Covenants. Beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. I hope we can take this warning seriously. And if you don't mind, I'd like to conclude this portion of the lesson with President Ezra Taft Benson's charge to choose humility. He said, let us choose to be humble. We can choose to humble ourselves by conquering enmity toward our brothers and sisters, esteeming them as ourselves, and lifting them as high or higher than we are. We can choose to be hum- We can choose to humble ourselves by receiving counsel and chastisement. We can choose to humble ourselves by forgiving those who have offended us. We can choose to humble ourselves by rendering selfless service. We can choose to humble ourselves by going on missions and preaching the word that can humble others. We can choose to humble ourselves by getting to the temple more frequently. We can choose to humble ourselves by confessing and forsaking our sins and being born of God. We can choose to humble ourselves by loving God, submitting our will to His, and putting Him first in our lives. Let us choose to be humble. We can do it. I know we can. Well, I believe that we can too. And I hope that we will. Now, for a bit of good news. These chapters are not all doom and gloom. And here I'd like to ask the opposite question to begin the lesson. Can you give me some examples of good news from the past year in world history? Now, your class might struggle with that one a little bit more, but certainly there are positive things happening in our world at this time also. Temples are being built and dedicated. Missionaries are spreading the gospel far and wide. Service is being rendered to many that are in need. And hopefully, in our personal lives, we can all recognize great blessings that God has given us and our families. Yes, the world has problems, but there is a lot of good out there as well. These chapters in Helaman also have some good news in them. Yes, there's more dark cloud than silver lining in them, but there is a silver lining. So for our final activity, browse the following verses, pick the one that's your favorite, and be able to explain why you like that particular message so much. Here they are. Some of my own thoughts on these particular verses. Helaman 8.15 And as many as should look upon that serpent should live. Even so, as many as should look upon the Son of God with faith, having a contrite spirit, might live, even unto that life which is eternal. I love the example of the brazen serpent because it shows how easy it can be to be healed. All it took for the Israelites was to look. And if we simply look to Christ with faith, we too will live, regardless of the darkness all around us. And sometimes I'm asked why Jesus is represented by a snake in that story. I mean, just last week we talked about how Satan is like a snake. Why the brazen serpent as a symbol for Christ? Well, the brazen serpent is a symbol for Christ, but perhaps not in the way that you think. The snake actually does represent the adversary and evil in this instance as well. 
Remember, the Israelites had been bitten by poisonous snakes. In Old Testament times, when you defeated something or killed it, you would often lift it up for everyone to see, to show that you had conquered it. Now, I know it's a little morbid, but sometimes they would do this with the heads of their enemies. To lift something up was to show that you had power over it. Well, that's how the brazen serpent is a symbol for Christ. That's what he's done with the snake. Christ has defeated it. He's overcome it. And if we just turn and look to him, he'll defeat it in our lives as well. That's good news, isn't it? Helaman chapter 9, verse 39. And there were some of the Nephites who believed on the words of Nephi. And there were some also who believed because of the testimony of the five, for they had been converted while they were in prison. It's nice to know that some of the people repented at Nephi's words and miracle. We may not be able to change everybody we come in contact with our faith, but maybe we can change some. We may not be able to convert everybody who we meet as missionaries, but hopefully we can affect some. Not everybody is righteous and believing in our communities, but some are. Maybe even within your own families, you can't say that all are active and believing. But perhaps you can say that some are. Let's be grateful for the some, <laughs> that we don't stand alone. There are plenty of other believers out there for us to draw strength from. That's good news. Helaman 10, 4-5 Blessed art thou, Nephi, for those things which thou hast done. For I have beheld how thou hast with unwearyingness declared the word which I have given unto thee, unto this people. And thou hast not feared them, and hast not sought thine own life, but hast sought my will and to keep my commandments. And now because thou hast done this with such unwearyingness, behold, I will bless thee forever. And I will make thee mighty in word and in deed, in faith and in works. Yea, even that all things shall be done unto thee according to thy word. For thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. This was God's response to Nephi after so many of the Nephites rejected him. He gave him power. Incredible priesthood power. It's nice to know that even in a wicked world, priesthood power can be wielded by the righteous. What can we do to more effectively release priesthood power in the world? Do what Nephi did. Declare the word. Don't fear the world. Don't seek your own life, or don't be selfish. Seek God's will and keep his commandments. And if we do this with unwearyingness, then our priesthood power and influence can grow. In fact, in this case, Nephi's priesthood power is so great that God gives him the sealing power or the ability to do basically whatever he wanted. In a sense, he made Nephi a god. He could control the weather. He could control the mountains. He could control what happened to other people. Now that's power. Righteousness increases the release of priesthood power. That's good news. And finally, Helaman 12, 23 through 24. Therefore, blessed are they who will repent and hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God. For these are they that shall be saved. And may God grant in his great fullness that men might be brought unto repentance and good works that they might be restored unto grace for grace, according to their works. The good news? We can repent. We can change. God is merciful, and we can be restored unto grace for grace. I'm so grateful that God is merciful, because I know that I get prideful towards God and my fellow man. I know that I need a great deal of God's mercy to get me through this life. And I know that we live in troubling times and that bad news swirls around us in a seemingly unending cycle. But that's why we have the gospel, which actually means good news. 
in my mind, that goodness and light and truth ultimately triumphs over all the bad. And one day, because of Christ and his grace, all bad news will end. All wounds will be healed. All death overcome. All evil vanquished. And all who have put their trust and faith in God and Christ will have all forgiven. So until that day, let's push forward like Nephi did. It is possible to be good in bad times, to let our light shine in dark circumstances, and to be humble in a very prideful world. Thank you for joining me this week. I hope you feel that you learned something by by spending this time with me. I'm so grateful for all of you who give me a chance to share my love of the scriptures with you every week. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.